Hello, BookTube. I've got some mail for you again on a Sunday. There was a ninja mail pile delivery. I don't know. I, my hat's off to the postal workers and the delivery people are out there working well after sunset, well after dark. But nevertheless, that's what happened. <laughs> I, I emerged from my bookish hibernation overnight to find a pile of mail waiting for me. So we've got those to open, but I want to start first with something that's already open uh, that I want to recommend to you in the strongest possible terms. I honestly want to just tell you, put this on Amazon pre-order. You are going to love it. It is going to make you ball like a little baby, and you are going to love it. Uh, it's totally unexpected for me. I don't think that I requested it. I didn't know that it was coming. It's called In by Will McPhail. It's a graphic novel. Uh, whether you like graphic novels or not, this is not a superhero graphic novel. and It's about an illustrator named Nick. And you will know, a lot of you, the first, and if you look at The New Yorker, you'll recognize his style. He is a regular New Yorker cartoonist uh, who has this kind of, the, the signature thing of his style is, uh, is bug eyes. <laughs> Let's see if I can get you a, a good example of it, although the book is full of examples. Yeah, his characters have bug eyes. Now, I don't really know why. I'm not, I'm not going to begrudge him an artistic tick. <laughs> Certainly, I like his use of, uh, of shade and proportion and all that. And who knew what kind of a writer he was? I had no idea. It's one of the things you don't learn from New Yorker cartoonists is what kind of pro stylist they are. This is a story about Nick, who is a, a zillennial right to his fingertips. He's a young illustrator who has no idea about anything, he has no idea even what he himself actually feels from one minute to the next. A total um, genuineness crisis that is so low-key that there's no way even to call it a crisis. He would even be embarrassed to tell anyone that. But as we meet him at the beginning of this graphic novel, he doesn't even know what he himself likes. He's testing out things to see whether or not he likes them as an adult. And he has absolutely no way how to let anyone in uh, to his world, to the, rea to the reality of himself. Not to make it too, sound too highfalutin, it's a, it's a normal thing. It's been the heart of every love story since the beginning of humanity. But nevertheless, here it's, it's captured in, in tremendous visuals. There's one particular visual motif for, the, for what that is, that, the difference between that world, the difficulty of anyone entering that world. And he... Uh, is in the course of trying to figure out one of these adventures when he meets a young woman who, it turns out, is an oncologist. And that is one story. And the other story is that his mother is slowly, torturously slowly rehabbing the family brownstone. And he visits her from time to time. I can probably get you a... Yeah, he visits her from time to time uh, to, to help out to help out with whatever task is next on the list. And those of you who read the made-up stories, those of you who read fiction, will already be able to guess the second main plot that develops if the main character has a grown mother and the main character meets an oncologist. You're probably going to be able to guess what another plot in this book was. Certainly I was. I guessed it as soon as it became... As soon as I became aware of those two factors floating around in the ether, I knew perfectly well that no one, not a novelist, and now it turns out not a graphic novelist, could resist bringing them together. And I admit, I kind of rolled my eyes. Nothing prepared me for the power of what, of what happens here. Nothing at all. Again, an age-old story, and not anything that any of us hasn't read before, but it's incredible. The result is incredible. Uh, this is fantastic. It doesn't come out until May, until early May, but take my word for it. Put it put in an Amazon pre-order and just get it. Especially since I'm told, uh, this is an advanced copy, I'm told by the, the publicist who I wrote, I, I wrote back to her just gobsmacked and, and said, what on earth did I just read? And she assures me that the color is very important. It's not just beautiful, it's very important to the book. So... A black and white advanced copy is not what you want. It's not what I want either. So whether you're a graphic novel fan or not, whether or not you think that you can read stuff that's in sequential artwork like this, uh, you should do it anyway. <laughs> you should do it anyway. You're going to love it. 
absolutely love it. And as I mentioned, it's going to make you ball like a baby. <laughs> so, so that is the first thing. That is not male. But then we do have male. Uh, if I'm a little flustered and I'm looking off camera, it's because my little schnauzer Frida is right over there on the bed. And we just had one of our massive battles of wills uh, for a trimming. <laughs> she, was, she was looking a little bit haggard. So I trimmed her with the scissors and she won't she's not a bad girl she's a wonderful dog she won't fight she very much does not like what's happening and she made sure that i know that but i had a feeling like for instance i had a feeling just theoretically i had a feeling that somewhere in the morass that was the top of her head there were two cute little ears <laughs> i had a feeling that was true and that if i just clipped enough i would find them and sure enough i did she looks like a martian now because they're sticking off her head instead of being these, these weeping willows <laughs> so she's not happy she's fidgeting and pouting i am going to give her a nice long walk out in the sunlight <laughs> to, to to thank her and also to, to warn her because when you go through I don't know how many of you do this, but when you go through a long clipping session like that, where you're constantly, the dog is constantly squirming a little, and you're constantly, there's a battle of wills going on. Towards the end of your goals, I always set goals. I don't just say, we're going to have a whole makeover. I say, I'm just going to set goals for just some parts now. We'll do some parts later on. Uh, towards the end, you just want it to be over. Everybody involved just wants it to be over. Uh, so it needs touch-ups, even the parts that I did need touch-ups i am going to need to touch the scissors in her presence again today because i'm not going to let the the little you don't you don't see the whole picture until you're kind of done and the dog is shaken and you've mopped up all the hair and there are some touch-ups that need to be done and they're around her eyebrows which she hates <laughs> so but, but anyway uh there is there is mail uh including this first package it barely got to me see that it barely got to me it is open it reached my doorstep open uh, but it's in the package. That counts. It got across the finish line. Uh, so let's see. Does the package have anything in it uh, that I might want to know about? No, no. Okay. All right. This is... Uh... Huh. Okay. This is... It looks like a small press book. Uh, did not did not request it, but here we go. This is uh, by Ham Martin, and this is Talk Radio, a novel. Nice looking thing. I don't have a pub sheet at all, so we'll just uh, we'll just go through this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. <I'm... clears throat> uh, there's <laughs> there's no. There's no uh, plot description on the back either. Instead, the author has made the perhaps wise decision to head off the top of the back of the book with a large excerpt from the Kirkus Review. And it seems extremely self-serving to read that, but we're going to read that Kirkus Review. Martin's debut novel offers an amusing portrait of a small town in Maine from the perspective of a local radio host. Who is this Vivian who wants to know everyone's name, who wants to discuss poetry and town folklore, but not the news of the day? The story is creatively told through the restraints of the talk show hours, weekdays between 9 and noon. Martin's debut explores the subject of loneliness and entertains the notion that other people can make the difference in one's life if one just tunes in to the right frequency. The prose is concise and sharp-witted, and the dialogue is strong throughout. There is something here for everyone, and Vivian holds it all together as the likable protagonist who is clever, funny, and genuine. The text remains entertaining from beginning to end, a heartwarming story told in an engaging way. And if you read it on Kirkus, it must be true. <laughs> that reviewer sounds curiously sexy. <laughs> anyway, uh, I may be familiar with this novel, probably just from emailing the author. <laughs> uh, if that sounds up your alley, uh, a, a feel-good book, an uplifting book, an intelligent, uplifting book, then there, you've got you've got a perfect example. Uh, let's see here. Oh, no, don't tell me my ergonomics are wrong again. Here, let's put that there, and we'll work our way down. We have a big box at the bottom, and I don't recall. Get it. The box is in a priority mail envelope, a priority mail box. That almost certainly means one of you has misbehaved. And broken rule number one. Rule number one being, don't send me a book. Yes, I am surrounded by books. Yes, I eat, sleep, and breathe books. Yes, but... 
the very fact that I have so many means that I know what I like and I like what I know. <laughs> but uh, uh, there's been no hope in enforcing rule number one lately because there's been a rash of violations and so many of them have been bullseyes that I it's hard to tell people don't do the thing that's making me squeal like a Girl Scout in the video. <laughs> it's hard to reinforce them. Anyway, I don't think this first one will be that. This is, oh no, okay, this is from, uh, this is from Harvard University Press. Great. Okay, so we have two books from Harvard University Press. First one is pa A Pattern of Violence, How the Law Classifies Crimes and What It Means for Justice by David Allen Slansky. Patterns of violence. No pub sheet. That's okay. As long as you don't have another Kirkus with you to read. We take for granted that some crimes are violent and others aren't. But how do we decide what counts as a violent act? David Allen Slansky argues that legal notions about violence, its definition, causes, and moral significance are functions of political choices, not eternal truths. And these choices are central to the failure of our criminal justice system. The common distinction between violent and nonviolent acts, for example, played virtually no role in the criminal law before the latter half of the 20th century. Yet to this day, with more crimes than ever called violent, this distinction determines how we judge the seriousness of an offense, as well as the perpetrator's debt and danger to society. Similarly, criminal law today treats violence as a pathology of individual character. Yes, it does. Uh, but in other areas of law, including the procedural law that covers police conduct, the situational context of violence carries more weight. The result of these inconsistencies and of society's unique fear of violence since the 1960s has been an application of law that reinforces inequities of race and class, undermining law's legitimacy. Okay, so legal scholarship. It sounds like it might be engaging. Much will depend on how well it's written. Uh, this is the Belknap Press of Harvard University Press, and the author is the Stanley Morrison Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. Um, okay, <laughs> all right, great. I'm not getting very many easy reads on this channel, but that's okay. That's fine by me. This, no, oh, by the way, this comes out uh, in March. And this next one, I think, comes out in March as well. No, April. This comes out in April. And this is by Marie Favreau. This is The Horde, How the Mongols Changed the World. Uh, again, no pub sheets. We'll just read from the book. The Mongols are widely known for one thing, conquest. In the first comprehensive history of the Horde, the golden portion of the Mongol Empire that arose, the western portion of the Mongol Empire that arose after the death of Chinggis Khan. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's back up a little. Is the approved back copy cover copy for this book saying this is the first history of the western Mongols? Well, it's saying the first comprehensive history, and I guess much will ride on that one, on that one word. Um, Marie Favreau shows that the accomplishments of the Mongols extended far beyond war. For 300 years, the Horde was no less a force in global development than Rome had been. It left behind a profound legacy in Europe, Russia, Central Asia, and the Middle East, palpable to this day. The author takes us inside one of the most powerful sources of cross-border integration in world history. What a great way to put it. The Horde was the central node of the Eurasian commercial boom of the 13th and 14th century and was a conduit for exchanges across thousands of miles. Its unique political regime, a complex power-sharing arrangement among the Khan and the nobility, rewarded skillful administrators and diplomats and fostered an economic order that was mobile, organized, and innovative. From its capital at Sarai on the lower Volga River, the Horde provided a governance model for Russia, influenced social practice and state structure across Islamic cultures, disseminated sophisticated theories about the natural world, and introduced novel ideas of religious tolerance. Okay, I'm on board. I now want to hear this argument. Absolutely. And the author is an associate professor of history at Paris Nanterre University, and she has been a member of the French Institute of Oriental Archaeology uh, and a visiting scholar at Oxford. Uh, Okay, <laughs> all right. So this is this is must be translated. Yes, uh, yes. No. The author has other books in French, but uh, no translators listed. So maybe this is was written in English, or was translated by the author. Either way. Uh, okay. So we have two two works of nonfiction from Harvard. Terrific. Uh, all right. Let's let's press on here. What's this next one. 
Oh, this next one is not the box, but I haven't noticed it also has a suspicious packaging. Uh, one of you, are there two violations of rule number one here? This would be bad. Two. Oh! 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 oh. Okay. Uh, here, let's get the the ugly sticker off this. I am amazed. How wonderful. Okay, I have mentioned this book before. I have praised it uh, before. Now I get to show it to you. This is Hugh Strachan. This is uh, the first World War, Volume 1, Two Arms, in the trade paperback. Enormous thing. A thousand pages in the trade paperback. This has blurbs from Robert McCrum, Raymond Carr, Richard Holmes, Max Hastings. Uh, and this is the first. This is the first volume in a projected trilogy about World War One. This is about how it all started. So it's deep history, lots and lots of personalities, lots and lots of politics uh, on how it all began. A much vexed question, a question that has that has spawned almost as many books on its own as the war has. Uh, and then there'll be volumes to follow. But the author, in the meantime, has written a one-volume history of World War One that has done really well for Penguin. It's it's the standard text in a lot of schools and there has been no volume two and no volume three he is he is uh as far as i can remember the first author ever to offer the reading public the one volume abridgment of his trilogy before he finished the trilogy <laughs> uh this is dense reading it's it's dense history but boy on a shelf of world war one books to have this is one to be on that shelf so fantastic uh, it's going to ruin my ergonomics because it's too big to fit on the holding shelf. <laughs> we'll put it on the floor for now. We'll just open this, uh, this final thing, this box, which also, look at that, only barely reached me. I wonder if, the, if everything that was in here is actually in here. Or, no, maybe it's, maybe this is empty. Wouldn't that be heartbreaking <laughs> if the box got to me, but without the contents? That would be just heartbreaking. Let's see what we have here. Looks like there's something in here. Uh, it's not very big. It's not very heavy. Uh, oh, the box almost broke apart, but not quite. Oh. Oh. <laughs> what on earth is wrong with you people? I know I ask that all the time. <laughs> Somebody went. To the trouble of getting me, I showed you on the Library Tour of Doom, I showed you uh, this thing, the Marvel Treasure Edition of the Mighty Thor. Uh, this is the issue, this is Marvel Treasure Edition number three. Number two was the Fantastic Four, and number one was Spider-Man. And I mentioned, I described what they were in that video, and one of you went and got me a couple of Marvel Treasure Editions. One of the sensational Spider-Man. Uh, look at this, they're in these, these archival wrappings, good lord. And the other of the Rampaging Hulk. He's fighting the Harpy and Modok. I'm not a Hulk fan, so I'm not sure who that guy is. <laughs> How he would decide who gets to eat, I have no idea. And then on the back of this thing, we have, uh, I wonder if I can take it out of this, out of this packaging. Because of course, I, uh, the intention is, is uh, well applauded, but... I am not an archival keeper of things. <laughs> so, uh, no, it came out rather easily. So this is going to be uh, just lots and lots of Ross Andrew artwork. Fantastic. Ross Andrew was such a great artist. Just such a fantastic artist. And the front of this has Spider-Man fighting the Hulk. And the back has this rather interesting collection of Spider-Man and the Human Torch, plus Iron Man, plus three members of the Inhumans facing off against... Kang the Conqueror. <laughs> that's that's kind of strange. Kang is not that big. First of all, he's not a giant. He's a great Avengers villain. A much more interesting, a much better Avengers villain than Thanos or Ultron. <laughs> but he hasn't appeared in, a, in an Avengers movie yet. The old school, old style Avengers fans love Kang and would love to see him appear in a Marvel Universe movie. Uh, but I don't think I have ever read through either one of these. So that's incredible. What a gift. Boy, whoever broke rule number one for this, I am sincerely hoping that you did not pay a lot of money uh, for a, a, a disheveled old coot that you watch on YouTube. I'm sincerely hoping that's true. This is a whole collection of Hulk comics. 
uh, looks like most of them drawn by Herb Trimpey, who was known even in his own day as just unbelievably crappy artist, <laughs> just a just really terrible artist. Uh, maybe this will change my mind on that. And there are backup, there's a backup story here, an original team-up between Hercules and Wolverine, uh, which may never have been repeated. Uh, this, it may never have been reprinted. It may just have, just languish in the back of this thing forever. It's only a couple of pages long. Where would you reprint it? I have no idea. It's drawn, uh, written by Mary Jo Duffy and drawn by Ken Landgraf. I don't, I don't really know Ken Landgraf. Um, and of course, as in all the cases, uh, the the heroes have to at least start to fight each other before they team up and fight someone else. Uh, yeah, and as usual, the shopkeep says my insurance doesn't cover superheroes. Although if you if you work in Manhattan, your insurance certainly would. Interesting. Kind of makes you wonder. Uh, oh, and then they then they just uh, like, hmm. I don't know this story at all, and I don't know the name Ken Landgraf, but uh, this sure looks like George Perez artwork to me. And that 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 looks like George Perez artwork. I don't know. Hmm. Well, one way or another. Fantastic. Thank you so much, whoever you are. I will get to explore these things. What, what, what nicer thing could there be than to read comics on a sunny Sunday? <laughs> so, so that is our mail haul. We have two Marvel Treasure Editions from late, late in the run. Do these actually have numbers on them? Yeah, uh, number 26 and 27. So years and years after that Thor volume that we saw. Uh, and then we have uh, First World War, Two Arms by Hugh Strachan. Volume one of his of his trilogy may never get finished, but this is a great volume on its own uh, about one of the most central questions, which is how on earth did the whole Western world end up at war with each other over the death of an official in one empire and one benighted part of the country? One one guy gets shot in Sarajevo and suddenly, you know, a month later, the whole of, the, of all the civilized world in the West is at war. How is that possible? And there are a lot of books on that subject. Uh, uh, the Sleepwalkers is a great one. Max Hastings also wrote a great book. Catastrophe 1914, I think is what it was called. It was also great on this. And this is fantastic. What a reread this will be. In fact, this is 1,200 pages long. So this might work for our March of the Mammoths, uh, an event that's coming right up. <laughs> and then we have uh, a pattern of violence. The author is going, to, is going to go at the whole way we classify different kinds of violence, different kinds of violations of the law. Then the Horde in which the author makes the case that the, the hordes of the Mongols in the West did a lot more than just kill every member of every city that they came across, that they, they were a trading and even informational hub. Fantastic. The, 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 very, the very fact that my instincts rebel against that makes me want to read the book, because the author could convince me, and that wouldn't that be great. And then finally, a, a small press book, Talk Radio, uh, that, uh, that will pick you up. If you need to pick me up. <laughs> so there we go. That is our mail for Sunday. Uh, fairly fairly mixed lot, as usual. <laughs> uh, but uh, but fun. I will be... I, I'm telling myself what a fun thing it would be to uh, idly flip through four-color comics in the bright, sunny sunlight. But it's the Hughes Tracking book that's going to get to me. That's what's going to make me want to... I'm going to... That's the thing I want to read more than anything else. And that's not fair to the two new books. The only excuse I'm using for the two new books is that they are far enough away so I don't have to think about them. <laughs> I haven't reread his book. I've only read it the one time. And I joined in the chorus of praise, but I don't think uh, when it came out, I don't think I was reviewing books. So I didn't join I didn't join in the public conversation. Yeah, two thousand one. So I wasn't I wasn't reviewing books when it came out. So I, I wasn't able to badger some poor long-suffering book section editor into letting me write about a 1200 page work on world war one uh boy oh boy if volume two ever comes out at 1200 pages you can be sure i will sing its praises or at least talk about it what if it's bad oh my god i can't even imagine that. it won't be sorry baby <laughs> that was an ostentatious yawn from my little dog so i'm gonna go signals don't get any clearer than that but i will be back thank you book two